want to thank all of you for joining me for another Bible study for this week where we are starting to come down to the final studies of this season with next week's study being the last study that we will have for this season. So first off again, I want to thank all of you who have been joining me for this season of studies. And again, I hope that you have enjoyed all of the studies. I hope that you have been able to grow from all of the studies that we have had this season. And so in our recent studies, if you're joining me for the first time, you're catching us where we are on a journey to the cross. It is Palm Sunday week. Palm Sunday is literally coming up. And so we have been taking a journey to the cross, taking a journey to see the purpose for why we needed Jesus and why Jesus needed to become our propitiation, why he needed to become the atonement offering for for our sins. And so to start us off down that journey, down the path to the cross, we we started off in the garden to where in a pivotal moment, the Lord, he gave instructions to Adam and Eve for them to follow in the garden. And Adam and Eve, they were left with the same choice that we have today when it comes to the Lord and when it comes to to his instructions. We can either obey his instructions or we can disregard his instructions. And so we know in the garden that, you know, maybe for a little bit of time that Adam and Eve, that they obeyed, but we know that ultimately they gave in to temptation. We know that ultimately they sinned in the garden. And so that got us on the journey to the cross, because again, in the first study that we had this series, we saw where there was a promise that was made to the serpent, that was made to the devil, where the Lord had promised his defeat. The Lord had promised the defeat of Satan, of the devil, right there in the garden. And so that kick-started us off down the journey, down the pathway to the cross. And so in our study last week, we took a look at the pivotal moments that occurred during the days of Noah, where, again, mankind and sin, it began to multiply, and it began to grow, and it began to spread throughout the land. And so... When that was happening, the Lord, he was very displeased. He was moved to the point to where he desired to destroy man off the face of the earth. That's exactly what scripture said. That's what we saw in our study last week. But thankfully for mankind, Noah walked with the Lord. He found grace in the eyes of God. And so Noah, he was able to live through the great flood because he obeyed God's voice, right? And we know that a promise, a covenant was made with Noah when he set foot on dry ground. We then fast forwarded, again, going down that path, taking the journey to the cross, where the journey, it brought us to the days of Abraham, where the Lord again, he called out to mankind. And thankfully for us, Abraham, he listened. The Lord had instructions for Abraham, and Abraham, he obeyed. And so we saw that in the pivotal moment of Abraham's obedience, when he walked by faith, we saw again that the Lord, he made a covenant. He made a promise, made promises to Abraham, which again points to the cross, okay, where we saw in our study last week, the Lord to Noah said that he would not destroy the earth because of the sin of mankind. To Abraham, the Lord promised that all the families of the earth would be be blessed. And so here we are in our study this week. We're in our study this week. We are going to, again, take a look at a couple of promises that comes from the Lord to mankind. Because, again, the Lord, he desires, the Lord desires one thing from us, and that is for us to dwell with him. That is the purpose. That is the reason why God created mankind, because he desires for us to dwell with him for everlasting life. And so the journey to the cross is for that purpose, so that you and I, so that we can be able to dwell with the Lord for for everlasting life. Okay, so here in our study this week, we are going to use the 31st chapter of Jeremiah We are going to jump off from scripture there to take a look at the two promises that we are going to be focusing in on here in our study this week. The scripture that we are going to be reading from that we're going to focus on here from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, 
is going to be from the 31st verse down through the 40th verse. Again, the scripture that we are going to be focusing in on here today in our study is going to come from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. And again, we're going to work our way down from the 31st verse down through the 40th verse. So let's take a moment here. Let's read over this scripture. What I'm going to do here is I want to, I want to start off by taking a look at the 31st and the 32nd verse there in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. So let's start off. Let's take a look at that scripture. Let's see what that scripture says to us here today. We see there in the 31st verse, the scripture it reads, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The 32nd verse, it reads, it says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So there are a few things there that I want to point out in both of those verses. There are a few things there that we have to break down, again, that are very pivotal to the fact that, again, we are making the journey to the cross. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about there, it appears there in the 32nd verse where God said that he was a husband to Israel. We need to understand what the Lord meant by that. What did it mean that the Lord was a husband to Israel? All right, what is the point? What is the purpose of that statement? In order for us to understand the point of that statement, let us go over to the fifth chapter of Ephesians. And there in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, I want us to take a look at the 25th through the 27th verse. This scripture, it may be familiar to some of you because we just went over this scripture in a Sunday school lesson that we had uh, in, in this past quarter of lessons. There in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, we read there in the 25th verse, the scripture says, Husband, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 26th verse says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now let us pay close attention to the role of the husband here according to how Christ lived for the church, with the church being his bride. Again, pay close attention there to the fact that Paul said, husband, love your wives. And then look at the manner of love that the husbands are supposed to have for their wives. Paul, he based the manner of love that the husbands are supposed to have for their wives based on the way that Christ moved for his bride, with his bride clearly being the church that we see there in that scripture. Notice how Christ gave himself for the church. Notice again what the scripture says there. In the 25th verse where Paul said that Christ, he loved the church, that he gave himself for her. What is it that Christ gave for the church? What is it that he gave for, for his bride? He gave the church, he gave the bride, he gave us his life. Christ, he literally laid down his life for us. And why is it that he laid down his life for us? Again, take a look there at that scripture. So that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, so that she should be holy and without blemish. Why did Christ do that? Because Christ, he loves us. And because again, the plan, the plan that we talked about in the first study of this series. And, and again, I mentioned it earlier. The Lord desires to dwell with us. God, he is not going to dwell with sin. His only begotten son is not going to dwell with sin, right? So you and I, we have to become holy and righteous in order for us to be able to dwell with the Lord. And so the only way that could be done was, again, for Christ to give everything for us. Again, he laid down his life for us. And so with that in mind, again, that's how husbands should live for, for their wives. They should live in submission. You know, we always talk about 
we use that 22nd verse there. We, we, we try to use that 22nd verse again to lord it over women, saying, well, wives, they are to submit to their husbands. But again, Paul was saying there that husbands, they ought to, to submit to their wives. They ought to give everything for their wives. And so with that in mind, when we go back over to the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, and we take a look at that scripture there again, where there in the 32nd verse, the Lord said that he was a husband to Israel. We should understand that the husband, that the Lord was saying as the husband of Israel, that he gave everything. He loved Israel. And again, he said there that he led Israel, that he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He led them out of Egypt by the hand, the scripture says there. Okay? So, What God was looking for out of the children of Israel was for the children of Israel to be faithful to him, right? Because the Lord there was saying that he was faithful to Israel, that he lived in submission to Israel. Again, he led them out of bondage from Egypt. He heard their cries, he heard their prayers, and he was attentive to them, and he moved on their behalf, and he led them from one who thought himself to be a God, right? And so in return here, we see where God, he desired for Israel to live in submission to him. Again, wives should submit themselves to a husband that is faithful to them, to a husband that loves them, to a husband that gives everything for them. And so that's what the Lord was looking out of the children of Israel, okay? Okay. But again, we see here in this 31st chapter that there was something that happened between the Lord and the children of Israel. We see there again in that 31st verse that the Lord needed to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And again, there in that 32nd verse, the scripture said, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I brought them or that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, the Lord said there, which they broke. So there was a covenant that was made, all right? And again, we're not talking about the covenant that was with Noah. We're not talking about the covenant that was with Abraham. We're talking of another covenant. Again, the Lord said a covenant that was made with their fathers in the day that he took them by the hand and led them to the land of Egypt. That covenant, it was broke. The covenant that was made when the Lord brought them out of the bondage of Egypt. What was that covenant? For us to know what that covenant was, let's turn over now. Let's take a look at the 19th chapter of Exodus, where we are now going to take a look at Scripture there. From the fourth verse through the sixth verse, they're in the 19th chapter of Exodus. Let's take a look at that. Let's read that scripture. Let's see what that scripture says there for us. So in the fourth verse there, we'll see where God speaks about what he did to the Egyptians and how he bore the children of Israel on eagles' wings and how he brought them to himself. There in the fifth verse, the scripture, it says, Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And there in the sixth verse, the scripture reads, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So that scripture, it almost reads as a proposal, right? It it reads like a proposal from the Lord to the children of Israel. Okay? And again, I want us to pay close attention to this proposal. And I want you to notice the if and then statement, which makes this proposal a conditional statement, if you will. Notice the if and then there, where the Lord said there again in the fifth verse, if you will indeed obey my voice. He says there again, if you will keep my covenant. So we have an if and then statement. If you do this, then that, right? And so the then part of that verse we'll see is, 
then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. So if and then a conditional proposal, a conditional statement that we see here, if you obey, if you keep my covenant, then the Lord said again, you shall be a special treasure to me. All right. That is conditional. All right. Then there in the sixth verse that that then statement, it continues, right? Because the sixth verse says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That could not happen unless, again, the children of Israel obeyed God's voice and kept his covenant. So again, this is an if and then proposal. And it is conditional, right? Is it conditional based on what God would do? Or is it conditional based on what the children of Israel would do? Well, it's conditional based on what the children of Israel would do, right? God doesn't have to do anything here. He said that he would do something, but he would only do something if, again, if the children of Israel, if they obeyed and if they kept the covenant, that is the only way that the Lord was going to do anything for the children of Israel. The only way that they would be a special treasure to God is if they obeyed. The only way that they would be a, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, is if they kept God's covenant. So this was a very pivotal moment for the children of Israel, again, on the journey to the cross. Because again, like we saw with Adam and, and Eve in the garden, they are given this, this choice, the same choice that Noah faced, the same choice that Abraham faced. Are you going to obey or are you going to disregard? Are you going to obey or are you going to disobey? Are you going to obey or are you going to ignore? It's the same, it's the same choice that, again, all of us have today to where we have instructions from the Lord. I'm not going to dive into that this week. That's for next week. But yes, we have instructions from the Lord, right? And everyone walking in the world today, those that walked in the world in the past and those that will walk after us, they will be left with that same choice, obey or disobey. So this, again, it was a very pivotal moment for the children of Israel to where the Lord has made a proposal to them. Now, let's take a look at the seventh and the eighth verse there to see how the children of Israel, let's see how they responded to this proposal from the Lord there. So we'll see that Moses, he came and he called for the elders of the people there in the seventh verse, and he laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him to do. And in the eighth verse, we'll see, then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So. They agreed, right? They they clearly agreed to the proposal there. They agree here to be faithful, all right? They agree here that they were going to obey. They agree here that they were going to follow. Again, the condition was to obey God's voice and to keep the covenant, all right? And so, again, we have been talking about this a lot lately as well. Obedience means that you listen and then you do. It does, the instructions don't go in one ear and out the other ear. It goes in, you comprehend it, right? It settles within, and then you move. You move to complete the task. You, you move to get a job done. You, you move to get something done, right? That is obedience. That is following the instructions. The problem here, however, is that the children of Israel, they didn't truly understand what they were getting themselves into. And I don't want to make that sound like uh, the law, that there was something wrong with the law. There can't be anything wrong with the law because, again, the law, it comes from the Lord. And the Lord, he is holy and righteous. But again, I will say that the children of Israel, they did not understand the gravity of, of making a vow to the Lord. They did not understand the gravity of making a promise to God. Do you understand the gravity of making a vow, of, of making a promise to the Lord? 
Now, if you don't know the gravity of making a vow of making a promise to the Lord, let's take a look here at scripture that we can find over in the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes. And again, in the, the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes, we're going to take a look at just a couple of verses there. I want us to take a look at the fourth and the fifth verse to see what it is that, that Solomon said about making a vow, making a promise to the Lord. Again, we must understand the gravity of making a vow and of making a promise to the Lord. Let's see what it says there in that fourth and in that fifth verse. The scripture says there, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay, the scripture says. So I don't know about you all, but it sounds like it is very important to, to keep a vow, to keep a promise that you have made with the Lord. You, you just don't want to break a promise. You don't want to make, you don't want to break a vow that you have made with the Lord. And, you know, again, many of us, we, we don't understand the gravity of, of making a vow and, and making a promise with the Lord. But something that I hope that you take away from this study, at least up to this point, is that it's serious business when you make a vow, when you make a promise to the Lord. Again, I don't think the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, I don't believe they understood the gravity of the choice that they had made. Again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with, with making a promise to the Lord, but you have to make sure that you can keep that promise. And you should, again, if you say that you're going to follow the Lord, if you're going to say that I'm going to obey his word, you can't go out and then live a life to where you aren't even putting forth the effort. You've heard me say this before. Faith is truly important, right? It is truly important for us to be faithful. What is most important about our faith is that we, abs that we actually try to put forth the effort. Again, you've heard me talk about professed believers. You heard me talk about this a lot this year. But there are many who love to profess that they are Christians, but they don't put forth the effort of faith. They love to profess that they are a child of God, but they don't put forth the effort of faith. Do you think God, do you think that he is pleased with those who don't even try to put forth the effort of faith? Now, that's something that, that is something that we should seriously think about. If you aren't putting forth the effort of faith today, you better, especially if you have made a vow, if you have promised, if you have said that you are a child of God, if you have said that you are a Christian, if you have said that you are going to obey his word, you certainly, most definitely, should be putting forth the effort of faith. Now, the children of Israel, like I said, they didn't understand the gravity of the promise, the vow that they had made. And the reason why I say that is because over in the 32nd chapter, of Exodus, when we take a look at the 19th verse, we'll see that the children of Israel, that they immediately broke the covenant that they had made with the Lord. Moses, he went into Mount Sinai to receive the two stone tablets, tables from, from the Lord. That was the law that was his covenant. And Moses, he stayed up in the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. What did the children of Israel do? Did they wait patiently for Moses? Did they wait patiently for the Lord? No, they built a calf of gold. How do you think that the Lord, how do you think that he responded to that? Do you think God was pleased with the children of Israel after saying that they were going to obey his word, that they were going to keep his covenant? They went out and they made a calf of gold and then they worshiped it. Let's take a look at what it says there in that 32nd chapter and the 19th verse there. We are told there that as soon as Moses came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. He saw the calf of gold. He saw the worshiping. And so Moses' anger, it became hot. And he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. So Moses himself, he, he wasn't pleased. And if Moses wasn't pleased, you certainly know that, that God wasn't pleased with that. But again, what we find in Scripture, because we're looking at Scripture that was well after the days of Moses, right? We're looking at Scripture. Our focus for today is from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, right? 
So we know that the Lord, he was merciful to an extent because this generation of Israel, they did not enter into the promised land. It was their, their children that entered into the promised land. But God, we know again that he was merciful overall to, to Israel. And again, we know that the Lord was faithful to, to Israel as well. Even though Israel chose to continue in sin all the way from, from that point all the way through the kingdom years, through the divided kingdom years. Because again, we have this 31st chapter of Jeremiah. We are able to see where the Lord in his mercy, he said there again, that the day is coming where I am going to make a new covenant. Now we get some insight on this new covenant. We'll read from the 33rd verse down through the 36th verse here. Let me get over there. Let me pull it up here on my tablet here. We'll see the scripture it says there, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, with the Lord saying there that he will put his law in their minds and that he would write it on their hearts, the Lord is drawing a drastic difference between the law that was given to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, the covenant that was made with them at Mount Sinai, which we call the Mosaic Covenant, he is drawing a drastic difference between that covenant and then this new covenant that he has, uh, that he's speaking about here in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. The fact is, is that the covenant that, that was made with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, it was engraved on stone tablets, right? But they broke that covenant. And then Moses, he literally came down and he threw those stone tablets down to the ground and those stone tablets, they broke as well. That that literally, he literally shattered the, the covenant, if you will. But here, the Lord said that he was going to, to put it in their minds and that he was going to engrave it, that he was going to write it on their hearts. It speaks to, and, and I don't want to say like the Mosaic covenant that it wasn't spiritual, but this speaks to, to the law coming through the Holy Spirit, all right? This is going to be the work of the Holy Spirit within the heart of the believer, within the heart of the children of Israel. It, it wasn't going to, to be simply wrote on stone tablets for someone to be able to pick up and to hold and to read. This covenant was going to be engraved on the hearts of, yes, the children of Israel, the house of Judah is said there, the house of Israel, but again, this covenant, it is looking ahead. It is looking ahead to Jesus. It's looking ahead to the cross as well, to all of those who would believe. The Holy Spirit dwells with all of those that believe. And the covenant, it is made, it is given to us through the Holy Spirit. So the Lord is talking about a new covenant that will come away by the Holy Spirit there. And so we'll see here, as we continue to take a look at that scripture, we'll see there in the 34th verse, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the last of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So this speaks of a personal relationship, a personal fellowship, between one and the Lord, one who the covenant has been made with and one who has agreed to the proposal, who has agreed to, to come into the covenant with the Lord. The Lord says that he is going to be the one that trains the one who enters into this covenant with him, the one who enters into the relationship with him, the one who enters into fellowship with him. It's not going to necessarily be man, even though I preach and even though I teach, it is the Holy Spirit that does the true work inside of the hearts of believers, okay? Let's take a look at what else is said there in the 35th and in the 36th verse there. The 35th verse says there, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, 
who disturbs the sea and his waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. The 36th verse says, if those ordinances, if they depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So when it comes to this new covenant, we should understand that, that God, he is adamant about this covenant, unlike the covenant that was made with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, unlike the Mosaic covenant, this covenant, it would be unbreakable. So let us think about this again for a moment. Why was the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai with the children of Israel, why was it breakable? Why was it able to be broken? The reason why it was breakable, the reason why it was broken was because the Mosaic Covenant, it was dependent on what the children of Israel would do. Yes, God said that he would do something for the children of Israel, but again, it was a conditional covenant, as in, as it meaning that that covenant, it held up to what the children of Israel would do. Again, if they obeyed, if they kept the covenant of the Lord, then God would move, then God would do, right? But they disobeyed. They made the calf of gold. And even after the Lord showed them mercy, the children of Israel, when the Lord had brought them to the promised land to be able to inherit the promised land, they said, no, 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 we want to turn around. In fact, we want to go back to Egypt, Right? And even after the generation that did inherit the promised land, we know that, again, all the way up and throughout the divided kingdom years that the the children of Israel, we know that Israel, the house of Israel, we know that the house of Judah, that they forsook the Lord. And so that covenant, it couldn't be savaged between the Lord and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, not because God failed, but because the children of Israel, they failed to to obey, they failed to keep the covenant. And so that was why that covenant, that is why it was breakable, and that is why it was broken. Because once again, with the Mosaic covenant, what it shows to us is how fallible we are, as in we mankind. We are fallible creatures. Our nature is sin. Our nature is to disobey. It is a struggle for us to be faithful. We we have to battle to be faithful. Think about that for a moment, right? Many of us today, and, and Paul, he said this himself as well, many of us, we desire to, to obey the Lord. We desire to, to live in obedience to his word. But we often find ourselves fighting a war with our old selves, with our within our inner man, as Paul said, where again we we have a law present in us that is the law of the Lord, which we desire to live by. But there, as Paul said, is another law that is present inside of us, which is the law of sin, the law of our flesh. And those two contrary parts, they end up duking it out. All right. And again, I went over this in, in last week's study. And so we have a battle that often takes place where in that battle, sin wins out, temptation wins out. And so what the Mosaic Covenant, what it proves, what it shows is that we need help to be faithful. We need help in order for us to be obedient. This is why God needed to make a new covenant. And here in this new covenant, the Lord is adamant that it is unbreakable. Why is the new covenant, why is it unbreakable? Because again, for the most part, as we see there, the Lord said it is dependent on on what he will do. God, he, he was adamant, he was so adamant about it that he compared the new covenant and it being unbreakable to, to essentially the working of nature that he has ordained. And so, yes, we see there in that scripture where where he talked about the moon and the stars. He talked about the heavens, right? Talking about space, talking about the universe, even talking about this rock, our world, talking about how the waves, how they obey the ordinances that, that he has set. Those ordinances, they cannot be broken. 
That is how adamant the Lord is about the new covenant as well. He said that it cannot be broken. It cannot be broken because God himself, he is faithful. Before he is faithful to you, God is faithful to himself. God is not going to lie to himself. God is not going to cheat himself. You may lie to yourself. You may cheat yourself. Don't look at me like I'm strange. I know we do it. I lie to myself. I have cheated myself before as well. But God, he isn't like us. His ways, they are higher than ours, right? The Lord, he is faithful to himself, and he is not going to break this new covenant. Now, this new covenant that we see that we have been going over here in our study today, it's, even though we are seeing it here in Jeremiah, even though the Lord is speaking of it here in Jeremiah, this new covenant it was actually made through someone else. It is promised to someone else. It was promised through someone else well before the days of Jeremiah. It was actually promised through David. To see this, let us turn over now to 2 Samuel. We'll take a look at the seventh chapter of 2 Samuel. And there we are going to take a look at the eighth verse. And then I'm going to skip down to the 11th verse there in 2 Samuel. And we'll go from the 11th verse through the 16th verse. I want us to take a look at, at the promise that the Lord made to David. And again, keep in mind that the promise that the Lord is making to David, it is relevant to what we are going over here in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. So we'll see there in the 8th verse, the, the 7th chapter of 2 Samuel, that the scripture says, Now therefore thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And when we skip down to the 11th verse, we'll see that the Lord said to David in his promise, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled, it says there in the 12th verse, and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, it says there in the 13th verse, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. The 15th verse says there, but my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And lastly, there in the 16th verse, the scripture says, And your house and your kingdom shall be established, listen to this, forever before you. Then the scripture says, Your throne shall be established, again, listen to this, forever. So in all of that scripture there, this promise that the Lord has made with David, the Davidic covenant is what we call it, right? Did you notice any if-then statements there? Does this covenant that the Lord has made with David, does it sound like it is dependent on anything that David would need to do? Does it sound like it is a conditional covenant? Now, I want you to notice there, from that 11 through the 16th verse, I don't see any if-then statements like what we saw when it came to the covenant that the Lord made with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. In fact, the only thing that I noticed there is a bunch of I wills there, okay? Again, in that 11th verse, the, the prophet said that the Lord would make a house to David. He said, I will make you a house, is what the Lord said. Then again, there in that 12th verse, we see that the Lord said, I will set up your seed. He said there again, I will establish his kingdom. He said, I will establish the throne of his kingdom. He said, I will be his father. I will chasten him. I, again, I just see a bunch of I wills. And then again there in the 16th verse, the Lord, he concluded all of it by saying, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So this covenant, it is an unbreakable covenant. It is an everlasting covenant. And the reason, again, why this covenant is unbreakable and the reason why this covenant is everlasting is because it's not dependent on us. If it was dependent on mankind, that covenant, it would have fallen apart right away, almost immediately. 
Because again, our nature is, is to disobey. We struggle to even be faithful to ourselves. And, and that's truly a, a sad statement to make. But God, on the other hand, he is faithful. He is faithful to himself. And so this covenant that the Lord has made with David, again, it is contingent on what he would do. It is contingent on the Lord being faithful to, to himself before he could be faithful to the Lord, or, or faithful to David, I should say there. Now, we see that in that scripture where the Lord was speaking about a seed of David, who is the seed of David that is in mind here in this covenant. Many of us, we may think of Solomon, because again, the scripture there said that a house would be built in his name. Solomon, he did build the first temple. But again, there, if we look at that scripture, and if we look at that promise closely there, we see the word forever. And just as I mentioned, the words forever is mentioned there. Solomon, he died, right? Solomon, he isn't still walking around today. He died. And so the seed that is in mind here would be one again that came through David. And here is where we see this covenant, the Davidic covenant. We see that it is pointing ahead to Christ and it is pointing ahead to the cross. Because again, we're talking about everlasting. We're talking about an everlasting kingdom. We're talking about an everlasting reign. We're talking about one sitting on the throne for eternity. This world, it is going to pass away, okay? But again, Christ, the Lord, is eternal. And all of those who will believe in him, what is it that we have been promised by the Lord? And I'll get into this next week, all right? Everlasting life, right? So this new covenant that we have been talking about here in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, this new covenant is looking ahead again. It's looking ahead to Christ because Christ is the new covenant. He is the seed that is being spoken of there. It is looking ahead to Christ. It is looking ahead to the cross. This new covenant, the one that is engraved on our hearts, right? All of us who are of sincere faith, at least anyway, it is looking ahead to what Christ did for us. And again, we're going to get into a lot of that in, in our study next week. So again, this study today, it is all about faithfulness. And again, what we have seen so far in, in our study is that God, he is faithful to us but again, the question is out there. Will we be faithful to him in return? And again, so far, we have seen that it is a struggle for mankind to be faithful to the Lord. Now, some will begin to wonder, some will question, well, how is God faithful? Some will even say, well, he isn't faithful to me. Some will say, well, God, he doesn't answer my prayers. He doesn't do anything for me. And so to that, we can turn over to, to James, and we can take a look at what James said about one who doubts. And James, he said in his letter that those who ask of God and they doubt, he said that they're like a double-minded man, and they should not expect for God to do anything for them. Why would God move for someone who doesn't, who doesn't believe that he can, right? Why would God move for someone who doubts what he can do? So one must, if they pray to the Lord, one must believe. That is the only way that the Lord will, will move for them. But again, some will say, well, God, prove to me that, that God is faithful to me. Prove to me that God, he is faithful. Well, we have these covenants that we have been taking a look at for the past few weeks here to where, again, we have taken a look at four covenants that will show, again, God's faithfulness, all right? We saw it again with the covenant that, you know, was made with Noah, the covenant that again was made to Abraham, right? And then there was that covenant that was made with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. God didn't fail. Again, I say God didn't fail that covenant. 
It was the children of Israel that fell that covenant. And then there's the covenant again that the Lord made with David. And so again, someone may say, well, prove to me that God was faithful to what he promised to Noah. Prove to me that God was faithful to what he had promised to Abraham. Prove to me that God, he was faithful to, to what was promised to David. Let's prove it here. All right. Let us turn back over to the eighth chapter of Genesis. And let's take a look at the 21st and the 22nd verse there to again prove that God was faithful to what it was that he had promised to Noah. Let us take a look at what it says there in those verses. When we take a look at the covenant with Noah there in the 21st verse, we'll again see that the Lord had said to Noah, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imaginations of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, it says there in the 22nd verse, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night, they shall not cease. Now, I don't know about you, but the world is still here, right? The world, it is still spinning on its axis. The world, it is still orbiting around the sun. It hasn't been destroyed due to mankind's sin. We try to do our best to destroy the world, right? We go out and we we fight wars. We destroy the land, land which was once beautiful land. It becomes desolate because of mankind. We talk about global warming today, whether you believe in global warming or not. I do believe that, that we have a heavy influence on the environment in which we live today. And so again, I tell you, we do more damage to the world than what the Lord would do destroying us. We, we try to destroy ourselves, right? So I would say that God, he's been faithful to what he promised to know. All right. I would say that the Lord has certainly been faithful to, to what he promised to know. And so from, from that point, showing that God is faithful, we can again take a look at what the Lord said to Abraham. All right. Let's turn over. Let's look at the 12th chapter of Genesis. Let's take a look at what was said there in the first through the third verse. And then we'll take a look at what was said in the eighth verse in the 17th chapter. We'll see there in that first verse that the Lord promised to show Abraham a land. The second verse, it says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And there in the third verse, the Lord promised to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, here's the promise, all the families of the earth shall will be blessed. And over in the eighth verse, it reads, it says there, also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, this promise, this covenant with Abraham, again, it's, it's, we, we, we talk about it as, you know, one single thing, you know, just the covenant of Abraham, but there's three parts to it, right? To where, again, there in the first verse, the Lord said that he would show Abraham the land, and then over in the the 17th chapter and the 8th verse, we saw where the Lord had said to, to Abraham that he would inherit the land and that he would give the land to his descendants, that God would give the land to the descendants for them to inherit and for them to have for, for everlasting life. That's the first thing that we saw there, right? And then the second thing we saw there was that Abraham would be made into to a great nation. Then the third thing was that all the people, of, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Out of those three things, I would say that two of those things have been fulfilled, right? I would say that Abraham becoming a great nation was fulfilled. The children of Israel, they rose to prominence. One of the, the longest lasting uh, people it is in the world today. We date them all the way back to their time in scripture, all right? And, and I do believe that there's a remnant that is still out there today. So I would say that God was faithful to that promise to Abraham in that the children of Israel, they did become a, a again, a great nation of people. And then I would say that the Lord, he fulfilled the promise about all the families of the earth being blessed. Now, someone may say, well, my family, we don't have much. How can you say that we are blessed? How is it that the Lord kept his promise that to Abraham that all the families of the earth will be blessed? That promise was kept through the giving of his only begotten son, 
That promise was kept by God through the giving of Christ. And again, I'm not going to jump. I don't want to kill my study for, for next week. But through Christ, the world is blessed. And I'll leave it at that. And we'll dive more into that in our study next week. Now, as it goes for the land, again, the land, if you take a look at Scripture in the book of Deuteronomy, the land, it became a conditional thing between the Lord and mankind to where, or I should say the Lord and the children of Israel, I should say there, it became conditional to where the Lord said to the children of Israel, you will have this land so long as you live in obedience. But the children of Israel, if you take a look at the opening of the book of Judges, they failed to, to move doing it. They failed to move in doing what the Lord had commanded them to do. Where with Joshua, they moved to take the land and they took control of the land, but they failed to possess the land completely. I don't believe that that land will be fully possessed uh, possessed as it is laid out in the promise to Abraham. I don't believe that will happen until the day that Christ comes and he set up the millennial kingdom. That is when that promise will be fulfilled. That promise, again, it has not been a failure on the part of the Lord. And that's one of the conditional parts of the promise that, again, man or the children of Israel, they fail in, in that promise. Okay, And so then we get to the promise that was made with David. The promise that was made to David, it has been fulfilled. And again, the promise that was made to David, it has been fulfilled because God gave the world his only begotten son. So I would end on this note, this study. God, he is faithful, whether you believe it or not. God, he is not going to cheat himself. He's not going to lie to himself. The Lord, he is faithful and he has been faithful to what he has promised. But again, the question remains, are we, will you be faithful to the Lord? Okay, that is the question that, again, we must answer. All of us, we must answer that question today because that's what the Lord looks for out of us. He looks to see if we are faithful, if we are striving to, to be faithful. Okay, so we're going to stop right there. Again, I want to hold off on, on diving much deeper into Jesus, uh, fulfilling the promise that was made there to David, because we have one more covenant that we are going to be taking a look at in the last study of this season, the last study of this season that will be next week. And I hope that you will come back for the study next week as we close out this season of Revelation. This has, again, been a wonderful season, and I truly do hope that you have enjoyed this season. And again, I hope that you'll share this study. Share it. Make sure that you share this study with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment. Follow today.